The following presentation is coming to you from the Diocese of Orange, California, the home of Christ Cathedral, where the Catholic faith is made crystal clear. This is SJEN-TV. And so verse 27, and beginning with Moses. Now, he begins with Moses. What books of the Bible would that be if he begins with Moses? Chapter 24, verse 27. Beginning with Moses, those books would be the first five books of the Bible, right? Known as the Torah, the Pentateuch, um, and what else? The Law or Moses. See, we love to confuse people. We got four different terms for that. Torah, Pentateuch, the, the Law, or just simply Moses. And so he begins with the first five books of the Bible. He begins with Moses and all the prophets. And he interprets to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What's the most amazing thing about Emmaus is Jesus is explaining what the scriptures mean. But there's one big question. Why doesn't Luke just give us the long explanation of here's what he said about this, 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 this. Why can't he just give us that explanation? Wouldn't that make things easier for you? Yes or no? Well, that's the duty of the church. And that's the duty, that's the duty of the church in the, way, in, in the way that it teaches the gospel to explain the, the meaning, significance of the scriptures, how they are fulfilled in the person of Christ. And it's the duty of each one of us as well to know the scriptures and explain what they mean to others. And so every time you come to Mass, it should be like going on the road to Emmaus because we start with the Old Testament usually. Then we have a responsorial psalm that echoes the message in that first reading. Then we have a second reading, which is often, you know, has a complementary message or could be a little different. And then we finally have the gospel reading which is often related to that first reading as well. And have you ever noticed that on the Sunday readings? Do you, do you take time to study those Sunday readings? And if you do, you will get a lot out of Mass. How much do you put in? You'll get a lot out if you look at those Sunday readings and you read them and you say, why this first reading? Why this responsorial psalm? Why this gospel? And suddenly you'll say, wow, there's a connection between all three of these. Isn't that amazing? And so Christ interprets the scriptures and talks about how they concern him. This is so important because the scriptures point to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah and the Savior of the world. And certainly there's a lot of good things scripture can teach us about how to live, how to change our lives. All that's important. But we must understand that there's also a prophetic value in scripture. There, there's a prophetic value in the scriptures that are proclaimed every single time we come to mass. And if we miss that, we're gonna miss a large portion of what's being intended for, that, for those readings. Verse 28, let's go to verse 28, are you ready? It says, they drew near to the village which they were going. He appeared to go further, but they constrained him saying, and what do they say? What do they say? Stay with us. Those words are so beautiful. Uh, you know, just stay with us, Lord. We want to be with you. We want you to be with us. Isn't that our desire to always want to be with the Lord, to be in his presence? Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. And so he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, it says, he took the bread and blessed and broke it, and gave it to them, and their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished out of their sight, and they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he walked with us on the road, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven gathered together, and those who were with them, who said, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Now, have any of you guys had the chance to go to Emmaus? Have any of you had the chance? There's a few different um, uh, 
candidates for where Emmaus was located. But probably the most likely place, it's located about seven miles away, it's called Abu Ghosh. And it's like a Benedictine monastery. And it's, it's down kind of at the bottom part of the hill. And if you go up the hill, the, if you go up the hill, it's a place called Kiryat Yerim, which is the place where the Ark of the Covenant was before David brought it to Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing? They're both there, and they're both kind of Catholic con, you know, convents, you could say. So you can, hit, you can get a two-for-one if you go to Emmaus, by the way. You just have to hike up a hill you know, for a quarter mile. And what's also interesting, I've been there plenty of times. There, there is this uh, shawarma place, which is like the best shawarma place in Jerusalem. And I, 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 would, you know, I would say if you do go there, go to the shawarma place too, because it's, it's really worth it. But uh, you get to hit both of these, two, these places, Emmaus and then Kiryat Yerim, where the Ark of the Covenant was a thousand years later before David brought it to Jerusalem. I think it's really, um, I think it's really amazing if that is the exact location of Emmaus, because here's where the Ark was before David brought it to Jerusalem. Here's where these two disciples were walking as they were going away from Jerusalem and they encountered Jesus going away from the city. Direction is often important in the Gospels. But then Jesus is at table with them and he, look at what he does though. The breaking of the bread can be a technical term for the celebration of the Eucharist. He's at table, he takes the bread, breaks, blesses it, he takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them. Those four verbs, take, bless, break, give, are very important. Because you find it, if you look at the celebration of the Last Supper in the, the Synoptic Gospels, Paul's recounting of the celebration of the Last Supper, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and the miracles where there's a multiplication of loaves, you see those basic four verbs used. You see take, bless, or give thanks, break, and give. And it's really amazing because when you look at the multiplication of loaves and you study them closely, you go, whoa, this is preparing the reader for the celebration of the, of the Last Supper of the Last Supper, right? And then what's amazing too is in Matthew's Gospel, you have two multiplication of loaves, right? But in Luke's Gospel, you only have one. But then you have the road to Emmaus. And you have one more time, take, bless, break, give. And so as the multiple, here's my point. You're kind of going, where are you going with this, Father? Here's the point. As the multiplication of loaves prepare us for the Last Supper, Emmaus looks back upon the importance of the Last Supper. Do you see? And so, and, and so it's amazing when you, when you look at it. And so he, he takes the bread, blesses, breaks it, gives it, and it says that at that moment, verse 31, what happened at that moment? Their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Now, why did Jesus vanish from their sight? Why did he vanish? This is the, this is the hundred dollar question in the Gospel of Luke. Why did Jesus vanish from their sight at Emmaus? Because he is with us in the Eucharist. That's why you need to ask that question. Why did Jesus vanish at Emmaus? Because he is with us in the Mass, in the Eucharist. And so, isn't it amazing when you, when you look at it, like at that moment, their eyes are open, and then he vanishes. Then they recognize him in the breaking of the bread, and he disappears, because he's with us in the Eucharist. So continue on. Let's go now to verse 32. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened to us the scriptures? Isn't this amazing? Do you, does your heart burn when you read the scriptures? When you're at Mass and you hear the readings and you see the connections? I mean, there, there, should, there, should, there can only be significance within, uh, with the scriptures if we make an effort. 
If we don't make any effort to read Scripture, study Scripture, meditate on Scripture, pray over Scripture, our hearts are not going to burn. If we don't ask the questions, is it good to ask questions, yes or no? Yes or no? Of course. But it's the way you ask questions. Do you ask questions with faith that seeks understanding, or do you ask questions that are cynical? It's the way you ask those questions. And so if we ask questions with a faith that constantly seeks understanding, our hearts are going to burn when we read the scriptures, when we hear the scriptures. But if we don't ask any questions or have any interest, it'll just possibly go right over our heads. And so their hearts were burning. And so in verse 34, it says that they reported to them when they got back that the Lord had appeared to Simon. Notice Luke doesn't give us any details. You find all these details in John's gospel. And this is another important point. Luke tells us a lot of things that we only know from reading other gospels. And this is one case right here. The Lord's appeared to Simon. He's appeared to Peter. And in John's gospel, it's much clearer. And so... You know, in, um, in many years ago, there were scholars who said that, you know, maybe the gospel writers, they didn't know each other. They just each did their own thing. They didn't know each other. But in recent years, a number of scholars have been saying, no, 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 wait a minute. If you look at the gospels closely, it's, it's apparent that they knew each other. And this is something very important to consider, that, wow, they, they knew each other. And so some of the details you'll find you know, explained a little bit more in other Gospels. So it's good for us to read each Gospel and ask how they are complementary. So if we go now to verse 35, it says, Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Notice the term, breaking of the bread, because you're going to find the same term, the breaking of the bread. In what other book of the Bible are you going to find the same term? It starts with an A. It was also written by Luke. Acts of the Apostles. In Acts of the Apostles, you also find this term, the breaking of the bread. What did that mean? Did that mean they just kind of went out there and just took a bunch of bread and broke it? No. What it, what it seems to be is a technical reference to the celebration of the Eucharist and how Jesus manifested himself. He made himself known in the breaking of the bread. It makes sense when you look at the Last Supper and then when you look at Emmaus. If you don't look at the Last Supper as the background to Emmaus, you're not going to understand Emmaus properly. But if you look at the Last Supper and then you look at Emmaus, the Last Supper being the background to understanding Emmaus, Emmaus makes sense. Now, there's another Old Testament story which is really interesting, which is similar. It reminds us a little bit of Emmaus. Who was a person who re was rejected by his own brethren, sold as if he were a slave, thought to be dead, and then, he, then his own brethren came to him for mercy and he forgave them? and he revealed himself to them. Who was that? Joseph. Joseph. You know, isn't that amazing? Because you see the same thing with Jesus. He's rejected by his own people, even his own disciples. They think he's as good as dead. And it's our Lord himself who reveals himself on the road to Emmaus to his disciples. So you, you do, do seem some similarities with the story of Joseph also. I, I think that Luke is borrowing uh, from themes in Genesis 22 with Isaac and Abraham, their walk up to Mount Moriah, the conversation up to Mount Moriah, going in the direction of Jerusalem, and Emmaus is just going the wrong way. And also that Luke is borrowing from the story of Joseph, who revealed himself to his brethren, and the same thing, except it's in the fulfillment of the scriptures, and also the breaking of the bread that he finally becomes known. Go to verse 36. As they were saying this, Jesus himself stood in their midst and he said to them, and what did our Lord say? Peace be with you. Now, what is peace? What is peace? The simplest definition of peace is that God's intention for his creation is realized. 
the realization of God's order and intention for his creation. Well, of course, every, in other words, everything's the way God wants it. Huh? That, that, if everything's the way God wants it, of course there's going to be peace, right? That's the simplest definition. But there, a, a good way of understanding what peace is, especially from biblical terms, Jesus says, my peace is not like the world's peace in John's gospel. We can't have real peace unless we have peace forgiveness. Unless there's true forgiveness, there can't be peace. And in order for there to be true forgiveness, we have to turn away from sin. And so our modern world has a very mistaken concept of peace, that it's kind of a concept of we can be nice to each other, but just keep doing all these offensive things that offend God in his creation and offend, offend the Lord in his plan for human sanctity. And so here's Christ after he rises from the dead, the first words that he says, peace be with you. Now you have peace. The Messiah has died and risen from the dead. He does the same thing in John's gospel in John chapter 20, three times. Peace to you. Verse 37. But they were startled and frightened and supposed that they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do questionings rise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see that I have. Now, they, they didn't understand, not only did they not understand the resurrection, they didn't understand the bodily resurrection of our Lord. Our Lord is risen in glory. And he's trying to show them, look, it's truly me. And what does he ask for to prove it? Give me, give him what? Huh? Look at my hands, my feet, my flesh, my bones. And then he goes on, and, he, and if you go to verse 40, it says, And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and wonder, he said to them, And it's amazing because Jesus, he's risen, he's glorified. He does not seem to be subject to the laws of time and space. What is the resurrected body like? I can't tell you because Paul tells us that eye has not seen nor has ear heard nor has it even entered into heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Read 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2 and you'll see that. So I can't tell you exactly what the resurrected body is like. but seems, if you look at the stories of Jesus appearing in one place, being in another place, disappearing, that he's not subject to the laws of time and space. At least that's the impression that we have in Scripture. But he's trying to show them that he has a real body, a real, true human body that has now been glorified, and it can never die again. And this is so important because it, it helps us to understand the sanctity of the body, the, you know, if you look at the church's teaching of, of the sanctity of the human body, and, and, you, and you think that, wow, it's all leading us to the day when we are risen in Christ and we have a glorified body, when our eternal soul is joined to our glorified body. What's amazing, too, is that Jesus, he still has his scars. Now, how, how does that work? Once again, we don't know completely, but he still has his scars. And in John's gospel, he makes this very clear. In Luke, you can, he's hinting at this as well, where you know, they're, he's showing them his hands. He's showing them his feet, hinting at, it hints at the fact that, well, they would see the marks of his crucifixion. Verse 44, then he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Isn't that amazing? Because that this is the uh, th this kind of divides the Old Testament into three sections: the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. And even to this day, Judaism still has they call it the Torah, the Law, 
They, they, then they have the Nevi'im, the prophets, and then they have the Ketuvim, which is the writings, okay, where you have the Psalms and the other writings of the Old Testament. So it's very interesting to see this in Luke's Gospel, where it divides the Old Testament into three different parts, because that form of looking at the Old Testament, or way of looking at the Old Testament, is still uh, something that we see today in Judaism. Uh, the Law, the Prophets, and the writings is how it would often be translated. Here in Luke, it's the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. But what our Lord says is that everything written in the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And this brings me to one key point. The Gospel is a message of fulfillment. It's a message of fulfillment that, that, that demonstrates that God fulfills his promises. And this point is so important because, because a lot of times we'll say, well, the gospel, it's good news, right? It, well, it is good news, but it's God's good news. And that good news is only possible if God fulfills his promises in Christ our Lord. It's a message of fulfillment. And when we talk about the gospel, when we're talking with others about the gospel, do you realize that it's a message of fulfillment? Do you realize that God fulfills his promises? When you, when you begin to read scripture this way, it changes everything. Because then you want to tell people how God fulfills his promises. And so, look, going on to verse, let's continue on, verse 45. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Notice Jesus emphasizing again and again, he had to come and suffer. Boy, are you familiar with Isaiah chapter 53? Are you familiar with that chapter? Are you familiar with it? Like a lamb before the slaughter, like a sheep before the shears, he opened not his mouth. You remember that one? You, it was the very first reading on Good Friday. Good Friday, the very first reading, like a lamb before the slaughter, like a sheep before the shears, he opened not his mouth. Good Friday, we read that reading. And you can imagine our Lord talking with them about Isaiah chapter 53. There were some people who thought that maybe Isaiah 53 was just added to the Bible and Christians kind of just invented it and kind of put it in there because it sounds so much like the New Testament when you read it that, you know, some came up with that crazy theory, you can say. And in 1947, the, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, they, they were discovered in 1947, they were in a, in a very dry place in the Judean desert near the Dead Sea, and they had been put in these caves in kind of like little, little jars. And there's a few different stories about how they were discovered, but one of the stories goes that shepherds were looking for a lost sheep and they threw some rocks in the cave and they heard funny sounds and they went in and found the scrolls. And to make a long story short, they, they kind of were discovered by a few people, maybe a few priests in Jerusalem, uh, you know, came, you know, came to know of them, some of them Catholic priests, by the way. And... Um, and then finally, like, the news broke out and, and, you know, the discovery became more public. But one, among all these scrolls that were discovered, one of the, you know, you could say, you know, best um, finds was a scroll on the book of Isaiah. And when you pull it open, you, you, there's no chapter numbers like we have numbers, but you find what we have today in the Bible, Isaiah chapter 53, which talks about the suffering servant. And, and the reason I bring this up is, well, the, the debate about how this got in Scripture was kind of just settled immediately. I mean, it was definitely there in Scripture when they opened up the Dead Sea Scrolls and finally read the Isaiah scroll. But why do I bring this up? Because Jesus is opening up their minds to the Scriptures. 
undoubtedly he went to Isaiah chapter 53 and said, read that. And just said, this is fulfilled in Christ. And I'm just going to, because we have time today, I'm just going to go to Isaiah chapter 53. And I'm just going to read a section from it. Can you, are you ready? So in Isaiah chapter 53... I don't want to read the whole thing, but if you go to Isaiah 50, 53, verse 1, it says, Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or comeliness that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with wicked and with the rich man his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When he makes himself an offering for sin, he shall see his offering. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall profit prosper in his hand. And it goes on. But undoubtedly, our Lord went to throughout the entire Old Testament, pointed to the righteous people who suffered on behalf of the ungodly and told them how it was fulfilled in the Christ. And especially went to Isaiah 53 and explained how it was fulfilled in him. We know it because there's many references in the New Testament to Isaiah chapter 53. But this is the hardest question for Jews in the first century, even Jews today. And not just Jews, but basically every single person who has to go through trial and difficulty in this life. Why did the Messiah have to suffer and die? God wanted to reveal his love. And the Father chose to reveal his love through his Son. And he chose to do it in such a way so that he could show that he would give his Son completely to us. And, the, and this is exactly what our Lord did. He chose to die on a cross. The most humiliating way that one could ever die so as to reveal the love of the Father. And so beginning in verse 48, it says, You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. What is this whole promise of the Father? What's that all about? Do you guys know what that's about? What's the promise of the Father? The what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gift and a promise. Look closely at the vocabulary used in Luke uh, chapter 24 and also in Acts chapters 1 and 2. A gift and a promise from God. The promise of the Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Verse 50. And then he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. Now, do you notice Luke's, Luke's gospel just ends at the 
ascension. And Jesus is blessing them as he's ascending into heaven. I love that image of our Lord blessing them as he's ascending. And they're falling down and worshiping him at that moment. They're recognizing that he's truly divine. And where's it going to pick up, though? Part two. Acts of the Apostles. Notice how it just ends abruptly. And what's also interesting is Acts of the Apostles will end kind of abruptly too when Paul's in Rome. But really what you want to do after reading Luke chapter 24, you want to go to Acts and read, start reading Acts of the Apostles. And it's not an accident. We just celebrated Easter. And guess what the readings, you know, guess where the readings are from right now after celebrating Easter? Acts of the Apostles. Now, don't you think the church has this kind of figured this out after a couple of years? You know, that, you know, we just celebrated Easter and we're right into Acts of the Apostles. So may the, may the Lord bless you. And every time you go to Mass, may it be like being on the road to Emmaus. And the study of Scripture is so important. It's, it's important for every, every aspect of the faith, but especially... If you have a great devotion to Scripture, you will, you will have a great love for the Mass. You will get so much out of Mass if you have a great devotion to the Scriptures. And so I want to encourage you to, you know, to really you know, go out of your way to read Scripture and also to talk with others about the faith. May your hearts burn with, with love as you listen to the scriptures, and as you share them with others. We give thanks to God for this opportunity. Uh, it's been truly a blessing to be with you for these last couple weeks to do this study. And I pray that the Lord blesses each one of you in a special way, that God will use you in a special way in this parish to build up the kingdom of God. Please rise. The Lord be with you. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this opportunity, as short as it was, to just spend some time talking about Luke chapter 24, the road to Emmaus. There's so much more that could be said. Help us to take time to put it aside and to pray over these chapters. Bless your people that are here today, Lord. May each of us be an instrument in your hands in the, in the work of the new evangelization. I ask you to bless us and protect us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. have a blessed day. Thank you so much. God bless.